So I am so thrilled to welcome folks today to one of our Deeds lectures, um, for which we are unbelievably fortunate to have organized this one with the Department of Environmental Health Science. So a huge thank you to Dr. Vasilio and to the entire department um, of EHS for your leadership in making this lecture happen. So <laughs> thank you. Today, we're going to hear about the fast moving work and emerging priorities of Dr. Wycheck and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, or NIEHS, as well as the National Toxicology Program, both of which he has led since 2020, after serving as Deputy Director since 2011. In these roles, Dr. Wycheck oversees federal funding for biomedical research to discover how the environment influences human health and disease. And I know that today he's actually gonna talk about a really cool transformative framework for how we think about what environment even is. Um, we've done a lot of talking at the school over the last eight months about paradigm shifts and inflection points in public health. And I will say his leadership of NIEHS really uh, epitomizes that. And I think you're all going to be inspired, even if you don't count yourself already as an environmental health scientist, to become one uh, based off of the talk that he's going to be giving. I have to call out that he is a mammalian geneticist by training, and I actually knew about him before he became director of NIEHS because he discovered this gene called the agouti gene, uh, which as a former Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa, I knew agouti because we ate them in West Africa, but he discovered this gene as one of the drivers of obesity in humans and then started to look at the way in which the gene varied according to what you were exposed to. So some of this very early work on what he'll talk about today around the exposome. So a neat path from one scientific discipline to another um, to really illuminate whole human health. Prior to arriving at NIEHS, he served in a variety of other roles, leading the Jackson Laboratory as president and CEO, serving as head of the mammalian genetics section and director of the Office of Functional Genomics at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and serving as vice chair for research and professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Case Western. He completed his MS and BS at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, earned his PhD in molecular biology at Case Western Reserve, and received his postdoctoral training in the laboratory of, of Philip Letter at Harvard Medical School. With that, I could go on longer. Dr. Wycheck, we are truly thrilled to have you here and look forward to learning from and with you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, just doing a sound check. Can everyone hear me okay? Even in the back of the room? Terrific, I got some thumbs up. Well, I am just delighted to be here. I've just had a very energizing morning meeting with many of you, and I'm very encouraged by the both the science that you're doing and the collaborative spirit that you bring, you've got a wonderful dean who's bringing some terrific leadership to the school. So I'm gonna to talk today about the efforts that are underway at, at my institute to plan the future of environmental health sciences. But I wanna be clear, this isn't Rick's ideas. So we've been reaching out to the global community, listening to what all of you have to say and listening to what people in, outside the United States have to say of where, should we be going? You know, given some of the powerful tools that we have now to do environmental health sciences, where should we be going? And most importantly, one of the things that I'm personally passionate about is we need to integrate the environmental exposure of environmental sciences into the fabric of the way that we study the etiology of human disease. You know, air pollution causes uh, or is associated with you know, hypertension and a whole variety of other defects. It's not just gene variants that you inherit from your parents. So what we're putting together is now a framework. How do we start working more collaboratively together across different disciplines to ultimately, again, better understand the etiology of human disease? So let me, uh, since many of you are probably not so familiar with my institute, uh, I thought I would take just a couple of minutes to give you a little background. So what is NIEHS, Environmental Health Sciences, National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences? So we are one of the 27 institutes or centers that comprise the National Institutes of Health. You've probably heard of the NCI. Um, so we're one of those. Uh, now we're located in Research Triangle Park. So if you're gonna come to visit me and you take the Metro from the, uh, the airport to Bethesda, you've got about a 300 mile walk uh, <laughs> south to North Carolina to get to my office. So why are we in North Carolina? Uh, well, there's a good scientific reason and there's a good uh, political reason for that. So the science reason is that we're an institute, as you will see from our mission and vision, we're dedicated to public health. 
So if the government is going to position an institute dedicated to public health, why not put it right next to one of the, well, probably second only to the public health here at Yale, but <laughs> there's a great school at the University of North Carolina, uh, the School of Public Health. Duke, which is just down the road, has a very strong program in the environment, and North Carolina State University has a very strong program in toxicology. So why not put us right in the middle of all of these uh, outstanding institutions? So that's part of the reason why we're there. But the real reason why we're there is it turns out Governor Sanford had delivered North Carolina to the Kennedy, um, the Kennedy uh, group in 1960, way before most of you were born. And the quid pro quo was that when the governor in the mid 1960s had this vision to create the Silicon Valley of North Carolina, it's called Research Triangle Park. Has anyone heard of this? Okay, so most people have. NIHS was the anchor tenant. So you needed an anchor tenant, and then once NIHS was there, we drew in Galaxo, we drew in IBM and other places. And these to say, it's been a real success story. So we, like other institutes, we're not the biggest and smallest. We have about a billion dollars every year to spend to support much of the work that you're doing. Um, we have uh, our intramural research laboratories. Uh, in fact, we have two different intramural programs. One of them is the Division for Intramural Research, where we essentially study the basic um, networks, biological networks that drive human biology. And we also have the, the Division for Translational Toxicology. And that's where we take, it's more of an applied uh, division, where we take some of that fundamental knowledge and we build tools uh, to assess toxicity. So those are the two different intramural divisions. Most of the money that we have gets bundled up in the form of grants and contracts in our extramural uh, uh, program and ship out to places like Yale. So that's uh, the little bit about the, uh, the, the Institute. Now, what differentiates NIHS from the NCI and other places is really our mission and our vision. So we're all about uh, discovering how the environment affects people in order to promote healthier lives. And the vision is the real differentiator. So it's the provide global, global leadership for innovative research that improves public health by preventing disease and disability. So the preventing part is really the differentiator. So we think that the best way to deal with cancer is to prevent it in, in, the, in the first place. So that's the challenge. And we do that by studying the environment. Now, it's a challenge for us because we define the environment very broadly. It's not just synthetic materials like perfluorinated alkyl substances, PFAS, you know, Teflon, Scotchgard, and a variety of things. It's also a whole variety of different agricultural chemicals, uh, different uh, pesticides. Uh, contamination in the air, water, and the soil. We study disasters and wildfires. We study the influence of diet. We should be studying the influence of diet. Diet is a very important uh, variable in, in actually promoting a good human health, or if you don't, if you have a Twinkie diet, that's probably not going to be the best thing to promote your health. But we look at exercise, uh, psychosocial stress. I mean, these are really important. So we look at all of these different things, and so it's complicated. But additionally, I mean, what we're now emerging into, and part of the reason why Dr. Birnbaum hired me as the deputy director initially, is the recognition that we're all different. Okay, so we not only look different, look across the, uh, the, the auditorium. We look different, but we're also biologically different, and we respond to environmental exposures in different ways. So what we need is we need this sophistication, where we can now start thinking about not just population-based statistical averages about what's good or bad for you, but really looking at kind of individualized prevention strategies. So let me take you now, focus the rest of the time on some of the emerging themes that are part of our strategic plan. So we've been working on our strategic plan. I've done a lot of work on strategic planning and it's, you, you don't develop a strategic plan by going, you know, going into my office, locking the door and then figuring out what we're gonna do and then telling everyone else what we're gonna do. It's really engaging the world community. So we spent a lot of time last year at about this time we started by reaching out to hopefully many of you, you provided input. Uh, we also had uh, a series of uh, virtual, we call them open space. So anyone that was interested in a given topic could sign on to that, uh, that, that open space session and provide input. And we had breakout groups. And we took all of this information, synthesized this, uh, it was uh, this, these, uh, the concepts were presented to our senior leadership, to me and to the senior leadership team. Uh, we've developed some goals around this and we have a first draft. And so we are circulating this to our council and we're hoping that this will get on the street sometime in the next few weeks. 
you'll have a chance to take a look at this. We want public comments. You know, is the, the language in our strategic plan, does it reflect truly the types of input you want to give us? Because in the end, I want a strategic plan that we all feel that we can rally behind and actually join forces and do collaborative science together. So uh, hopefully we'll get all of this together and sometime maybe in the June, July timeframe, we'll be able to publish the, the, uh, the strategic plan. So now pay attention to that because when we look through grants, uh, as I look through every grant that comes through, we cross-reference this to our strategic plan. So how well does this truly reflect what some of the needs are that we've articulated in our strategic plan? So you might even wanna cross-reference this when you're writing some of your introductory comments and your, and your grants that you're sending in. So anyway, so with the remaining time, what's clear is that in our strategic plan, there are six different areas of scientific focus. And by the way, if you want the slides, I'm happy to give you the slides. So, uh, and the, they're, they're shown here. And we've come up with this diagram here where they're not discrete areas of, of focus, where you have precision environmental health, exposome, mechanistic and translational biology, toxicology, computational biology, data science, environmental justice, health disparities as climate change and health. They all kind of interface with each other. There's nothing that we do in exposomics, and I'll explain that in just a couple of seconds, There's a, that doesn't relate to the other areas of scientific focus. So that's why we tried to come up with this diagram. So it's not discrete areas, but these all overlap in a way that is that our job is to make sure that they're synergistic. So let me take you through these six different areas of scientific focus. Let me start off with the exposome. So this is something that I've been hearing a lot about, and in fact, Many of you may realize that it was Chris Wilde back in 2005. This was right after the Genome Project had been published and everyone was feeling good about themselves, that now we have this transformational project in genetics where we're going beyond one gene at a time. So I think that's what the Genome Project was. So instead of doing studying one gene, as I did as a graduate student studying the growth hormone gene, we want to look at the entire genome. So that was a transformational project. And Chris said, well, we need to do the same thing for the environmental health sciences community because we need to get beyond one exposure at a time because it's not just PFAS or PFOA or PFOS, or it's not just the PM 2.5. It's not just, unfortunately, the flame retardants that we are breathing in from the carpets and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, the fabric and the, the, it's all of these things. So we need to have a framework, a scientific framework going beyond one exposure at a time and so that's where he promoted the exposome concept. And furthermore, he recognized, as actually much of the work in my own lab, that some of the exposures that happen early in life can influence how your genes work much later in life. So it has to be about studying this over the, the time course, the lifespan. So, uh, so the, the exposome concept, you have the, you know, the physical chemical exposures, you know, shown on the bottom here, you have the uh, agricultural you know, chemicals, you know, fragrance products, uh, plasticizers, and actually we're learning a lot more about the, the potential hazards of, of, uh, of different plastics uh, in the environment. So you have, you have these, and, and, and so you know, much, you know, many in the environmental health sciences community thought, well, this is what we study. It's the physical chemical exposures. Getting beyond one exposure at a time is very important. But the exposome is also factoring in the social, the ecosystem, and the lifestyle variables. So we need to have a framework where we can study the impact of, say, chemical exposures or multiple chemical exposures, but it should be in the context of studying it relative to psychosocial and mental stress. Uh, and, and to do this in the context of, of uh, population density, uh, green and blue space. And then physical activity, sleep behavior. I mean, good sleep may be a, a way of mitigating some of the bad effects associated with the physical and chemical exposures. So when we do an exposomics experiment, we have to be factoring all of these different things into the equation. So the challenge is that that all feels good. We talked this morning, it's got great mouthfeel to it. The totality of exposures over the life course. Oh, this sounds really good. The question is, how do you do an experiment where you collect the totality of exposures over the life course. So one of the things we need, in fact, a couple of years ago as we started developing the plan is we need an operational definition 
So if, you know, I mentioned this morning, Francis Collins, the former director of the NIH said, look, Rick, I get the exposomics concept. How do I do an exposomics experiment? What data do I collect? Where do I put the data? How do I share the data? Well, those are challenges we haven't figured out yet. Um, and that's something that we need to be doing. So we need to, in fact, just like with the genome project, um, you know, the, this big, bold vision to sequence the entire human genome, I don't think anyone knew uh, what were the technologies that would ultimately get the job done. And I think we're faced with much the same challenges. You know, what are the capabilities that we're gonna need, the technological capabilities to actually do an exposomics experiment? So we're probably gonna have to invent some new things. So as we put forward this bold new vision, you know, keeping in mind that we're gonna to have to promote technology development, but we have to define what outcomes do we want those technologies, what data do we wanna collect? But the other thing is that uh, we can actually, uh, we can study what we call the pragmatic exposome. So this is actually Gary Miller at uh, Columbia. You know, the pragmatic exposome is, well, we do have the ability right now to actually collect things beyond one exposure at a time, you know, high resolution mass spectrometry. And we, act we talked about some of these actually with many of your colleagues here at Yale. So let's start with uh, what we can do now, keeping in mind the, the bold vision of where we want to be going, and then develop new technologies as they become necessary uh, to, uh, to essentially achieve this bold vision. So I, I look at this, you know, it's, I grew up as a genetic and genomics person. I look at the Genome Project as an example. You know, who would have thought back in, what, 1980, when the Genome Project started, that we would have the ability to completely sequence a, a human a, a genome for less than $1,000 that would be able to do some of the awesome things that we have capabilities of doing now in you know, say transcriptomics. I mean, no one even knew about RNA-seq and those technologies back in 1980. But that was, we had the bold vision. Then what were the technologies we needed to achieve that bold vision? So the same thing applies here. So we're still faced with how do we do an exposomic experiment? So one of the first uh, steps is to really define what is the definition of the exposome and, and a definition of exposomics. And so much to Gary Miller's credit, and so Gary is located right over here. If you haven't met him, he's at Columbia. So he uh, assembled a group of uh, leading exposomics scientists at the Banbury Center at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. So I know many of you probably haven't been to the Banbury Center, but this is a place where there is a lot of uh, high level strategic thinking that happens. They have these, do two-day courses. So one of the last meetings I was co-organizing at the Banbury Center was the Knockout Mouse Project. So that's where we were back in, what was it, 2002, deciding, you know, can we actually undertake a massive project to knock out every gene in the mouse? Um, and the answer was yes, we could. But that happened at the Banbury Center. So what Gary and his colleagues did was they worked on trying to figure out how do you define the exposome? So the, the, the exposome is the integrated compilation of all physical, chemical, biological, and psychosocial influences that human biology. Again, it's got great mouthfeel to it. Um, and exposomics is a transdisciplinary field aimed at a discovery-based understanding of how the exposome influences biology and health. But the key thing here is this operational definition. So it's a field that studies the comprehensive and cumulative effect of physical, chemical, biological, and psychosocial mediators that impact biology and systems by, and this is the key part, by integrating data from a variety of interdisciplinary methodologies and streams to enable discovery-based analyses of environmental influences on health. So what it means to me is that the bottom line is that there's no single implementation. You know, you don't go out to do an exposomics experiment where you collect the totality of exposures over the life course, okay? But you know, what you're doing is you're going beyond one exposure at a time. So if you're looking at PFAS, you're not looking at just PFOA, but you're looking at, say, the, the, the entire collection. And there may be other dioxin and other chemicals you may be interested in that you're studying at the same time. So it's just different than the traditional environmental health studies in that it is going beyond one exposure at a time. So actually, just in the interest of time, I'm going to just skip over this. So how are we going to make this happen? So we have work to do. And so I think I know that many of you know that we have uh, a, uh, an announcement on the street and we will be making a decision. We're looking to fund one center, not multiple centers that compete with each other, but one center that actually is, it has the responsibility to reach out to all areas of the, especially in the United States, all areas of the environmental health sciences community and pull together a plan 
So develop a conceptual framework to address exposomics. How do we do an exposomics experiment? What data do we collect? Where do we put the data? So that's what the center will be doing. We're going to put one, one and a half, about uh, $1.5 million in 2024, one award. Uh, so the idea is that this, would, this center is not about doing the exposomics. It's about creating a platform for how do we work together in really a culturally different way of uh, collaborating to do exposomics. So uh, we expect to, uh, to announce an award in the July and August timeframe. So stay tuned. So I know that you're all interested. Now, the important thing here is that in the past, you know, when you're doing exposomic stuff, it was NIEHS by ourselves. So one of the things that I've been doing, though, is reaching, reaching out. Uh, so Lindsay Cresswell at uh, NIAMS is the new director at NIAMS, very interested in exposomics. So she's put some skin in the game. So the 1.5 million is not just coming out of the NIEHS budget. Lindsay is putting money in. Uh, actually, the NCI is putting money in. NINDS, who well, the Korshets, is putting money into helping to fund the center. Richard Hodes, who's the director of NIA, the National Institute on Aging, is very interested in bringing exposomic scientists into studying how we you know, study the factors involved in human aging. And uh, so also women's health research. I mean, it's a lot of interest. And this is just a start. So actually, some of the other IC directors, I was talking with Rena D'Souza, who's the director of, uh, def, uh, of DCD, uh, what is it, uh, dental and craniofacial, said, well, why, why wasn't I asked to contribute some money to this? So, well, okay, we're, we'll work it out. Uh, this, uh, you know, get your checkbook and we'll, we'll figure it out. So there's a lot of interest in this. Let's get this center working well. And furthermore, uh, instead of competing with other countries, and that was the down, one of the downfalls with the, the genomics program. So the genomics program started, we had different laboratories, we had different countries competing with each other. Well, it's nuts. So once everyone figured out that if we work collaboratively together, we can actually get the job done. So let's model the whole exposome framework on working collaboratively at the outset. So the European Union is doing a lot of planning around exposomic science. So they have an award, it's the um, what is it? It's the uh, it's global coordination of exposomics research. So I've been meeting with them. I was in uh, in uh, in Utrecht and talking about how do we work collaboratively together. So whatever the eventual center that we have, their responsibility is going to be working with these centers. And I was in India uh, at the beginning of India of uh, beginning of January. They're very interested in exposomics. What can they be doing? So let's get everyone working collaboratively together. Okay, so let me move on to the next topic. It's uh, precision environmental health. So what is PEH? So this was, I first heard about this when Cheryl Walker and Andrea Baccarelli and Dana Dolan and I came and gave a presentation to the NIHS Council. And what they described is that this is really an attempt to begin to address the individual variability. And I referred to that at the beginning of my talk. So we all look different. We're biologically different. We're metabolically different. So, and we respond to the environment in different ways. So why not now kind of overlay the environment on this concept of precision medicine? Where in precision medicine, it was all about sequencing everyone's genome and then thinking, well, if we, we better understand what are the sequence variants that we inherit from our parents, we're gonna know everything you need to know about human biology and, and, and healthcare. Well, I think it's a little short-sighted. So uh, this is really about it complements precision medicine. We, we don't ignore the genome. The genome is important. It does give us differential susceptibility. But in the end, it's really about individualized risk to prevent disease. So as actually Cheryl defined it, it's about simple. It's about G by E by D. So you've got the genetics by the environment, and there's a lot, big dose of data science that comes into integrating all the different data streams, the omics data streams that will be part of collecting data here. So the G part of this is complicated. There is no single gene that confers differential susceptibility to whatever environmental chemical or uh, whatever exposomic exposure that you're interested in. It's likely to be uh, a very, it's called a complex trait. So from a genetic point of view, there may be potentially hundreds of, of gene variants that work collaboratively together that give an individual the genetic susceptibility to actually be exquisitely sensitive or less sensitive to a given environmental exposure. So that's complicated. 
So how do we get at this? The environmental health sciences community have to do this on our own, or can we work with some of the genetics and genomics efforts that are underway? Well, the good news is that there's this new emerging program. It's called the International Common Disease Alliance, the ICDA. And in fact, it was back in September of 2019, just before COVID hit, that Francis Collins and Eric Lander called the kind of the, the global genetics community together and basically gave us the challenge. If we want to study complex traits, and that's where the action is as far as genetic predisposition to obesity, you know, type 2 diabetes. And, and in fact, even you know, single Mendelian traits are modified by an assortment of other you know, modifier genes. So everything is really a complex trait. It involves multiple genes. But if you really want to get to you know, understanding the, the networks and the, these complex traits, you're going to need potentially tens of millions of people as part of your cohort. Okay, does everyone have to do that together? Well, no, the ICDA is all about, well, why don't we work collaboratively? So we have the million person cohort, and I'll talk about this in a second at the NIH. Uh, it's called the All of Us Cohort, but there are cohorts now in across the world. So the idea here with the ICDA is why don't we come up with standards in the way that we collect our data and how we archive idea so that we can seamlessly cross the, the boundaries of different data, data sets and that we can then essentially capitalize on the work that's being done in the, the, the Baltic regions or in Iceland and other places. So the, at the meeting that we had in September of 2019, I actually asked the question, I said, well, this is Eric Lanner, I said, well, Eric, where's the environment in all of this? And he said, well, how do you study the environment? I said, well, Eric, we'll have, uh, we'll have coffee. So the, the idea is now is that the ICDA really needs to embrace the fact that some of the phenotypes that they're studying as part of these large genetics and genomics experiments are likely attributable to environmental exposures. Probably a genetic and most likely a genetic contribution, but there are gene by environment effects. And that's where ultimately we wanna be if we wanna truly understand the impact of both the environment and genetics. So what we've been doing is working with the, these members of the ICDA. What can we be doing to uh, actually integrate the environment into studying you know, the genetics and the etiology of human disease. So the good news is that we have the All of Us program. So if you're not familiar with this, this is the, the one million person cohort that's sponsored by the NIH. I think it was one of Francis Collins's legacy programs when he was still the director of the NIH. And it's really about individualized prevention, treatment, and care. And uh, what's clear now is that it's not just about lifestyle and, and biology, but it's the environment is a very important part of this. In fact, if you look at what they've been doing, uh, so Jeff Ginsburg uh, is the, uh, the relatively new, I think it's about a two years he's been in that position. He's the medical and sci uh, scientific um, and medical director of the All of Us program. You know, he fully understands that if you want to enable precision medicine, you know, it's not just about physical measurements, behavior surveys, electronic health records, even though they are a mess, but uh, nevertheless, the data is there. Uh, wearables, you have to in integrate the environmental data. So they're very interested in doing that. So the challenge now is how do we do this in a systematic way on uh, potentially a million people and doing it cost effectively? So he's bought into, he said, okay, Rick, we're ready to go. Okay, start collecting this data and do it cost effectively and put it into our database. So the question was, what can we do uh, that is, uh, is cost effective, that is likely to have a big impact on studying these large populations. So one thing that was clear is that, uh, and I think many of you know, if you know where, so, where someone lives or lived or where they worked or worked, you know, GIS coordinates, you know a lot about their environmental exposures. Not everything, but you know a lot. So let's start off with GIS uh, coordinates. So phase one was to actually go back into the All of Us cohort and ask people where they live or where have they lived. And so with, uh, currently it's about 750,000 people. It costs about $30 million to go back and actually add that data. But nevertheless, they're, they're doing that. The next phase is to really figure out how do we develop the tools to integrate geospatial coordinates with uh, health effects and environmental exposures. So uh, that's what we're doing. And there's actually phase three here. I'll talk about that in a second. But once you have the geospatial data, uh, you can begin to use the global air quality models. Uh, you, you have daily weather. Um, you have all of the, 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 the data coming from 
the uh, the exposure to the wildfires in Canada. You know, if you're living in New York, you know, the data is available. You can now integrate that into you know individual uh, health records for people that are part of all of us. And of course, then you can also integrate in the CDC social vulnerability index. So there's a lot of information that you can gather by just knowing where someone lives and where they work. So we're doing that. But we're also looking to the future. So can we go beyond GIS coordinates? So we have a phase three pilot where we look at whole genome sequencing, electronic health records, extensive survey questions on lifestyle, social determinants of health. And then you're know, looking to bring in some of the kind of the pragmatic exposome, you know, high resolution mass spec. You know, we have serum samples from some of these individuals. And we're using, we're doing a pilot study with the risk of type two diabetes. So the genomes have been sequenced and we know a lot about the multiple different genes, the complex traits associated with type two diabetes. Now we're gonna overlay that with some of the additional environmental exposures. Then we're gonna ask the question, you know, how does knowing something about the environmental exposures, is that more powerful uh, than just knowing something about the genetics? And my prediction is it'll be the combination of both that really gives us what we need and, and, and we're for type two diabetes. But you know, this, we presented this to the IC directors and everyone was raising it. Well, where's, where's my area of focus here? You know, I'd like to get involved in this. We talked about uh, noise uh, as, as a part of the, the exposome. Uh, so there's all kinds of things about uh, noise as part of the exposome. You know, so if you're a, if you're a hunter, you know, and, and you're shooting your you're out hunting and shooting your shotgun, and you don't have ear, ear protection, what are you doing to your you know potentially uh, impacting your uh, your ability to continue to hear? So that's likely to be a gene by environment effect in the longer term. So anyway, stay tuned on that. So we're reaching out, getting a collaborative efforts going. We actually have a modest size program at NIEHS. It's about 20,000 uh, individuals where we're looking at genotype, phenotype, and the environment. Uh, this is a program. Uh, again, I don't have time to go into all the details here, but we're really trying to bring all of the different components, the G by E by D, using this as kind of a pilot that we can then ramp up into the million person cohort and potentially beyond the million person cohort to really engage in the global efforts around the ICDA. So there's uh, lots of things that are happening. And actually, at some point, maybe when you have me back, I'll talk about some of the data that's actually coming out of this very interesting program. So it's uh, Jan Hall and Alison matzinger Reef are the two PIs. We have our data scientists, Dr. Fargo and Dr. Schmidt, uh, joining in that effort. Okay, let me move on now to another area of scientific focus, environmental justice and health disparities. So I think many of you know, I think it was actually under uh, Dr. Olden's leadership, who, when he was the director, he was the first African-American director for an IC, an IC at the NIH. He came to the, uh, at the NIEHS, I think it was in the early 1990s, but he really brought environmental justice and made it a core focus of the work that we do at NIEHS. So I think we were some of the first, uh, first uh, well, one of the first ICs out of the blocks to really begin to study the issues of environmental justice. And more recently, um, I mean, we've done a lot, but there's a lot more we can be doing. So we've established a cross-divisional faculty. So we have members of the, the different divisions and they put together a, a program. And one of the key parts of their program in environmental justice is we gotta get Rick and other members of senior leadership out in front of the environmental justice communities and listen to what they have to say. So I've been doing this. And in fact, in two weeks from now, I'll be spending most of the week in central uh, California, listening to uh, some of the migrant farm workers and uh, others. Uh, what are some of the environmental issues, environmental justice issues? And there are there's a lot. But most importantly, we've actually been getting in front of these different groups. And you know, I've been you know we you know, the NIH does research, so that's what we can do. But I'm getting in front of these groups, and they're looking at me and saying, "Okay, you're back again. I mean, your predecessor was here, and your predecessor was here. We keep telling you what you want." Uh, we don't need more research. We need you to clean up our, our sites. So the research is clear. I mean, the water is full of PCE, uh, TCE, and the, uh, and the soil is contaminated with all sorts of god-awful things. So there's this place called the Western Electric Tar Heeled Army Missile Plant. It's in Burlington, North Carolina, in our backyard. So I went there, and uh, we met with the community. But this time, I, I decided that it's not going to be just the NIH. Okay, uh, so we're taking an, an all government approach. 
So I asked the organizer, I said, I want someone from local government there. I want someone from state government. I want the EPA there with me, okay? Someone who manages the Superfund sites. Where's the Army Corps of Engineers? So I want all of them on stage with me when we're addressing the concerns of the people in the community. And in fact, they were there. And what was clear is that the Army Corps of Engineers talked about how they've been doing all of this work. Uh, and then the state uh, uh, um, uh, health agency was there talking about all the work they were doing, but there was no points of intersection and the community wasn't getting cleaned up. So that the meeting that we had was, this was transformative. In fact, we had the person leading the environmental justice office at the White House who was there. Okay, so at the end of the meeting, we decided that we're gonna do some things differently where different parts of the, the state, uh, local state and federal government are gonna start intersecting. And we're gonna start develop plans to clean up the site. And furthermore, we want to know what is the local government gonna do with the site once it's cleaned up? So what's the vision there? So the good news is that this all of government approach actually worked. So instead of just talking to the group and listening to what, uh, actually my wife at breakfast a couple of weeks ago actually read the, the newspaper and she said, Rick said the uh, Army Corps of Engineers began excavating 300 tons of contaminated soil from this site. So we've taken the first step into actually cleaning up the site. And it turns out that the local government, they have beautiful plans of what to do with this site. It's right in the middle of town. So once it's cleaned up, this will become a, a focal for some of their economic development. So we're really pleased. So for your community engagement, you know, think about the all of government approach. So it shouldn't be just about doing research from the NIH, listening to what the community needs, but in many cases, I tell you, these, these, environmental, uh, these environmental justice communities, they want their site cleaned up. So the other thing I'll just comment in terms of environmental justice, uh, Secretary Becerra, uh, coming directly from uh, President Biden in the White House, environmental justice is a big focus of the US government. And so he, uh, Secretary Becerra pointed to the NIH and said, I want three things that the, you're gonna do in the next 18 months, okay? with definable deliverables in the, in the whole area of environmental justice. So uh, Trevor Archer, who's the uh, deputy director at NIEHS, uh, is actually taking the lead on this. We're putting together an NIH-wide approach, very similar to what I'll talk about in just a few minutes with climate change and health. And so we have uh, really kind of uh, migrating the centers of excellence in environmental health disparities to also include environmental justice. So you'll be seeing a more details on that. We also have something called the Environmental Scholars Program. It's modeled on the Climate Change and Health Scholars Program. I'll talk about it in a couple of minutes. Sorry, these slides are a little bit out of order. Uh, and we also have environmental justice training. We have something called the Worker Training Program that's part of our Superfund site. This is where we go in and we actually teach people how to protect themselves from environmental contaminants. So we have uh, some, some very specific goals that we're setting along uh, those lines. So let me talk about climate change and health. This has been a big area of focus. I know that many of you are interested in this as well. So this followed from soon after the inauguration, uh, a few years ago, when President Biden signed into uh, signed the executive order 14008. And this was all about tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. And he specifically looked at the NIH and said, look, NIH, there are health effects associated with climate change. I want the NIH to come up with a, an approach to study the health effects and bring greater awareness to the fact that there are health effects associated with climate change. So NIEHS has, had, been done, had been doing most of the work in, in climate change and health in the past. So we got $40 million from Congress uh, to do this. But I think you know, I recognize and many of us recognize that the issue of climate change and health is much bigger than what NIEHS can do on our own. And furthermore, there are capabilities across the NIH and there's interest, ac interest across the NIH. So let's work collaboratively on this. So let's develop now a strategy where we bring everyone working together a, a, against a common uh, um, set of principles and, and uh, using the $40 million, which is you know, a nice chunk of change, but it's not a lot of money, but can we use this in a catalytic way to really launch bigger projects? So the good news is that I actually uh, reached out and there were uh, actually six other IC directors initially that reached out. Josh Gordon is one of them, the director of NIMH. I uh, was very interested in engaging. Uh, 
Diana Bianchi, the director of NICHD, very interested and engaging. Gary Gibbons, the director of NHLBI. Uh, so they joined forces. We formed an executive committee. But more recently, just in the last couple of months, we've had the addition of Richard Hodes, uh, uh, Elaine Langevin at the NICCH, uh, the C C H, the Complementary Health Institute, um, the new director of NIEID, a new director of NCI. We're forming what we call the Executive Committee for Climate Change and Health. And we are providing strategic oversight to an NIH-wide working group. Uh, that's chaired by Aubrey Miller at NIEHS and Josh Rosenthal at the Fogarty International Center. Many of you know Gwen Coleman, so I've actually moved Gwen out of the extramural division. She's now reporting to me directly, and her job is to keep the butterflies flying in formation. So there's uh, a lot of coordination that happens, and we're, we're changing the culture of way, the way we're, we're collaborating together, and she's doing a fabulous job. So the, the issue of climate change is complicated. And it's complicated because there, there are not only direct effects. We talked a lot this morning about you know, what we don't know about heat-related illnesses, especially in people who may be on illicit drugs, uh, pregnant individuals. Um, so lots of things, uh, predisposition to heart disease. So we have to, we have to figure out what are the health consequences, some of the direct effects of climate change. But there are all these indirect effects. You know, the flooding that occurs, there are now chemical releases into uh, communities from super adjacent Superfund sites. Uh, there are changes in the air, water, and food quality and quantity. Population displacement. Uh, there are mental health consequences. That's why Josh Gordon is very interested in this, the mental health. I mean, if the, the hurricane comes and wipes out your community, you have to move to another. There are psychosocial stress. So there are in, in infrastructure and supply chain disruption. If the hurricane comes in and completely wipes out your healthcare system, where do you go for dialysis? Where do you go for chemotherapy? So we need a, a framework to study all of the direct and the indirect effects. So, and we need to do this in a way we also understand that uh, climate change doesn't affect everyone equally. There are underserved populations, exposed farm workers, uh, construction workers, persons with disabilities. You know, individuals vulnerable by life stage, uh, infants, young children, pregnant women, um, those that are vulnerable by chronic medical conditions, diabetes, asthma, and populations in low and middle, in middle income countries. These are all differentially impacted by climate change. So we need a strategy that actually addresses all of this. So fortunately, the working group uh, with membership from across the NIH came up with a an outline. The goal is really to reduce health, or threat, health or, uh, threats from climate change across the lifespan and build resilience. So there are four different core elements that the, the working group came up with. It's uh, health effects research, health equity, training and capacity building. We have a lot of training to be doing. So getting people with different capabilities, engineers working with biologists, and you're actually doing a great job of that here. Uh, and also intervention science. And we need to be doing this with an unprecedented degree of collaboration across global boundaries. And there are in many different areas of science, you know, basic and mechanistic research. You know, how does wildfire smoke actually affect the cardiovascular system and promote stroke and, and, uh, and heart attacks? So there's behavioral and social sciences research. Lots of different areas of science that have to come together in a way that we can contribute ultimately to achieving the goals. So I don't have time to go into all the details. Uh, NIH.gov forward, of course, we're in the government. We created a website, okay? And uh, so it's uh, NIH.gov climate and health. One word, climate and health, take a look at it. Uh, if you haven't done that already, I strongly encourage you to take a look at it because anything that's happening in this program is ultimately listed on that website. And again, I can't go into all the details here, but with the, with the 40 million that we had in 2023, we've actually funded some of these innovation, the P20 centers. And the P20 centers that design is all about getting people from different places with different capabilities working collaboratively together. And in fact, in some cases, the P20 centers are reaching out to Bangladesh and other, you know, Uganda and other um, uh, countries across the globe. We've also funded a number of what we call the ACE centers. This is the Alliance for Community Engagement. So we recognize that if we want to have an impact on uh, the health effects of climate change, we have to engage with the communities that are most directly impacted. And we also have a coordinating center, you know, someone who can keep all the moving parts working together, essentially creating that community of practice 
around climate change and health. And that's actually funded in Boston. It's the Boston University School of Public Health working together with Harvard. Again, this whole notion of let's work collaboratively together. And let's see. Uh, um, and then we also have uh, some collaborations with uh, some NSF uh, centers. So because we're the NIH, it doesn't mean we have to build everything ourselves. Let's reach out. And if there are capabilities at the NSF or other federal agencies, let's build on those capabilities and integrate them into the collaborative framework. So lots of things that are happening, but I do want to point out this. Uh, it's called the Climate Change and Health Scholars Program. So this is uh, actually the funding for this originally came from Dr. Tabak and Dr. Schwetz, who is the acting director and deputy director of the NIH. And this program is all about getting people who have interest and capabilities in the area of climate change and health, getting them into the NIH, either virtually or on campus, and bringing their knowledge to, uh, to bear on developing new programs in climate change and health. This has been enormously successful. Uh, so if you're interested, take a look at NIH.gov, climate and health. And so we may be going through another round to bring people on campus. So in the final, uh, so the mechanistic translational toxicology here, it's, uh, I just want to summarize this, that this is essentially the new, division, uh, new, new vision for our division of translational toxicology. It really goes beyond you know, injecting you know, mice or outbred rats with different doses of chemical, counting lumps and bumps and deaths over a period of time. It's really getting me the mechanistic, which biological networks within the, the, an individual human or an, an animal uh, are being impacted by environmental exposures. So a big part of this whole effort is to develop, is to use AI and ML, but uh, to develop you know, microphysiological 3D systems you know, derived from induced pluripotent stem cells. So we can take, uh, if you have an IPS cell from everyone in the audience, can you actually differentiate them into beating cardiomyocytes? And then can you look at the impact of different environmental exposures across genetically heterogeneous populations without studying humans, but studying your IPS cells? So there's a big interest in this now at the NIH. So if you're not aware of this, uh, there's something called the Common Fund, which is a, a collaborative uh, funding mechanism uh, so NIHS stepped forward together with uh, Joni Rutter, who's the director of NCATS, the National Center for, for Accelerating Translational Science. And so we now have a, this, uh, it's a program, it's called Complement. So Complement Animal Research and Experimentation. So the Complement was chosen because we're not talking about eliminating animal research. We're talking about developing new approach methodologies or NAMs that can be used to gain molecular insights into how environmental exposures can impact human biology. So there's a nice chunk of change. It's about $35, $40 million per year. And this, like many common fund projects, could go on. It'll go on for the first five years. And if we have sufficient progress, then it can go on for another five years. So the idea here is really developing some of these you know, in vitro, in silico, or in chemical approaches that can advance our ability to better understand how the environmental exposures impact uh, human biology. And in the end, just kind of quickly summarizing, as you may have figured out, there's a lot of data that has to be integrated here. So it's, uh, we've, we've, if, if you're, so plans get made when it's someone's job to develop a plan. Otherwise, everyone points to everyone else and says, we'll develop a plan. We now have actually a, uh, we, uh, you know this well, um, so we now have an office. So I've, you know, we created, actually it was under Linda's uh, uh, leadership and I actually was reporting into me as the deputy director, the Office of Environmental Health Science Cyber Infrastructure. And it's really, it's about really developing the plans. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna manage all these different data sets? And to do this in the way that we can, we can essentially make exposomics, uh, data-driven knowledge discovery happen, computational toxicology, make all of the other things happen. It's a huge challenge. So let me stop here so we have uh, time for Q&A. So thanks very much for being here. All right, Eve is gonna be doing her usual kind of walking around the room and giving folks the, the chance to be on the big screen. So I see someone's hand back there. And then uh, if there are Zoom questions, we'll try to do those as well. So we'll probably do about five to seven minutes of questions uh, just so that we have time for the next group to come in. And if, by the way, if you have questions that we don't have a chance to answer here, just rick.whitechick at nih.gov. Send me an email. And there's a lunch after this that hopefully okay. you're, so y'all can find him right. at lunch too. <laughs> okay.
Dr. Whitechick, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, on the subject of climate change, um, you know, I understand there are some serious knowledge gaps in ad adaptation research and even the basic mechanisms of how climate impacts health. But I feel like in public health, we often lose sight of the fact that the health sector also has a role in climate change mitigation. You know, we're responsible for eight and a half percent of emissions, and that portion is growing. So I wonder what role you see for NIEHS in, in climate mitigation research. Yeah, so it's again, I just want to emphasize it's not just NIEHS, it's about the NIH, because we're not taking this on by ourselves. So it's with, you know, there, there's so much that, that needs to get done. And so we're not focusing as much on mitigation as we are uh, focusing on, say, adaptation, studying health effects, and bringing greater awareness of the, the health consequences of climate change. But it doesn't mean that we're not working with others. I know that the National Academy of, of Medicine has a big focus on, and you know this well, it's a big focus on what can healthcare systems do to start mitigating the impacts of, well, the, the mitigate the, the uh, continuing of, uh, of, of exuding all of these toxic chemicals and CO2 into the atmosphere. So I think it's, it's really about partnership. We can't do everything on our own, uh, but it's, it's, we're aware of that, uh, but we're not focusing as much on mitigation uh, as we are in adaptation and other aspects. But on the other hand, actually, as we talked about this morning with some of your colleagues, um, you know, better understanding the health consequences may make us all more consciously aware of the importance to mitigate um, the, uh, the production of CO2 gases. Maybe you know, buying, uh, buying an electric vehicle, as I did, um, is, uh, is, although I don't have the, uh, the solar panels on the, on the roof <laughs> of my house yet, but uh, this happened. So we're, it's, it's a very important issue. But I, I do know that the National Academy of Medicine, that's a big focus. And there is, uh, I know some of the other IC directors are very interested in knowing what can we be doing and what can healthcare systems be doing to, uh, to be mitigating you know, climate change. I think we have a question on Zoom. So Holly. Yep. Yes, there is a question on Zoom. Someone asked if you could elaborate on how community engagement is integrated into the NIEHS programs and how many of them focus on community engagement. Well, I mean, almost everything. I mean, as, as, I, think, as I think you know, that the P42 center mechanism, and I think this is the legacy that goes back to Ken Olden. And I know that Linda Birnbaum fully supported it and I fully support it. And the community engagement is critically important. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, you need to, we need to get out and we need to listen to uh, the communities that are impacted by environmental exposures. And so if you want to write a credible grant and you really want to truly do something that impacts human health, you got to listen to the people who are directly impacted by this. So it's not only every P42 center, or every P30 center has, has to have a community engagement, but I can tell you that I'm, you know, as I showed you, I'm actually getting out now in front of uh, community groups. So this is important because community groups have to feel that they are partners with us in actually getting the research done. So they don't want to feel like, and I've heard this, they don't want to feel like they are guinea pigs in the data collection from happens from all these academics. And the academics, you know, use them as guinea pigs, collect all this data, get wonderful publications and high profile journals, and then it ends there. Well, it can't end there. So when you, when you engage the communities, they are partners in what we're doing. They help to design the experiments and uh, in many instances can actually help take the findings from, uh, from a study and actually make change happen within their communities. This is also relates back to, to report back of research results. This has been a big topic of discussion and it's complicated because what do you report back to different communities in a way that's truly meaningful but we're, we're, we're changing that too, developing strategies and how to report back research results. So it, it, it's kind of the bottom line, it's integrated into the fabric of almost anything that we do. And I could go on, but uh, it's, just, it's just really important. It's, it's squat that's what they did. Exactly. And so it's, it's NIEHS, I think, has really been leading this. And I mean, if, as a tangible example, it's, it's, it's a lot of the things I mentioned this to some of you, uh, with the, the rapid acceleration of diagnostics in COVID-19, we develop all these powerful um, vaccines and strategies for treating COVID-19, and then 40% of the population doesn't take it. So I think part of what we learned from that is that there wasn't enough focus on community engagement. 
Okay, well, why is it? Okay, you're going to develop vaccines. And they ever, I think we all expected you develop the most powerful vaccine that uh, the medicine has ever delivered to humanity, and everyone's going to stop what they're doing, and they're going to line up at the clinic to get their shots. Well, that's just realistically, it's not going to happen. And so that's another example. So community engagement has now become integrated into the fabric of the way that we do science across the NIH. Great question. Thanks for asking that. Unfortunately for, the sake of, uh, unfortunately, for the sake of time, until we get our new building, this room has to be shared by the lecture uh, that comes after us. So um, I'm going to invite you all, as always, to come and join us uh, for lunch. Um, you'll have a chance to ask more questions of Dr. Wycheck. A huge, huge thank you on behalf of the school. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the invite, and we're in this together. Yeah, amen. Okay. A, a little swag bag because you don't leave Yale without swag. Okay. So thank okay. you well, for thank, coming. Thank you very much. I appreciate okay. it. Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank great. You. That was